You know, as I look out upon this beautiful day that we've come into the Lord's house to worship, I, I think in about a month that everything will start turning green, you know, and uh, we'll see the signs of spring and the signs of life, and it reminds us of the life that the Lord has given us and the Lord has placed here on this earth. Each spring seems almost like a rebirth, you know, of life. And we have, um, as Southern Baptists, we have designated each one Sunday each year as the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday where we remember the value that God places on life. We remember that we are made in God's own image as human beings. We are special creations of His and that life is very important. I'd like to share a story before I get started about Abby. It comes from uh, one of our SBC centers that's committed to helping young mothers who um, have gotten into a bad place with their life and gotten into some trouble and have become pregnant but have chosen to protect that life rather than abort that life. And instead of taking the easy way out, whether it's legal or not, they chose to pr um, protect life. And this is about Abby. It says, Abby first came into our center in September 2008. She was 11 weeks pregnant and at an all-time low. She confessed that the baby she was now carrying was supposed to have been aborted back in July, not once, but twice. Both times she had been ready to go through with the procedures but didn't have enough gas money to make it to the nearest abortion clinic. Since that time, Abby has come into the center almost every month for prenatal and parenting classes and delivered a healthy baby boy last March. It's been amazing to watch the transformation in her life as she has come to rely on God as her deliverer and supporter. Although she's had to walk through a lot of trials as a result of the choices she's made, God has been faithful as she has, as she has learned to be obedient. Back in May, Abby rededicated her life to the Lord and says that her son's presence has brought such peace. She is currently seeking employment and has made huge strides in becoming emotionally, spiritually, and financially stable enough to provide for her family. We're so grateful for her life and the life of her little son. May God get all the glory for, for preserving his life, not once, but twice. Amen. Sometimes we don't hear the good side of the, the stories that uh, we know about abortion and about the, really the anti-life nature of our country. Sometimes we don't hear that there are people out there who are committed, who, who are saying, you know, I'm going to make a difference and, and stand up for what is right, and that is a life God has created. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, we find ourselves getting started with the Ten Commandments, which we all love and we all appreciate, and they make a big difference in our life. Uh, I think uh, we, we, when we read them, I think it connects us to our history of God's chosen people and to our future with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. And it teaches us great lessons about morality. But in Exodus 20, verse 13, it says this, You shall not murder. Now, there are, there are other translations of this. In the old King James Version, it says, Thou shalt not kill, but all murder is killing, but not all killing is murder. So technically the word, that if you translated it directly from the Hebrew, uh, just the way the Lord wrote it on the tablets to uh, Moses, it would have said, thou shalt not commit murder. This commandment doesn't pro prohibit killing animals, right? It doesn't. As a matter of fact, later on in this chapter, there are instructions about how to kill animals for sacrifice. So obviously it's not a commandment not to kill animals. It's not a commandment to, that prohibits capital punishment. Now, if you're against capital punishment, I respect your position. I, I understand it. I may not agree with your position, but I respect your position. And you may have some good arguments against capital punishment, but you can't. Make it from Exodus 20, 13, where it says, Thou shalt not murder, because capital punishment is just not that. Over in Exodus 21, 12, if you look, it says, He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. I mean, that's pretty clear. It's not, he wouldn't say one thing against capital punishment here and then say that in the very next breath. It's just not, he's not there. The commandment doesn't have anything to do with self-defense, right? 
killing someone in self-defense. Look at Exodus 22, verse 2. Just another page over in your Bible. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. Well, that's not right. I put the wrong one down. I'm, I'm sorry. Anyway, the fact is, the fact is, is that uh, self-defense, if you kill someone in self-defense, that certainly doesn't violate thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit murder. This commandment doesn't give a defense for pacifism. Stick it, staying out of war, it, it's not it. Now, there may be some good defenses for pa pac pacifism. There are some brothers in Christ who have long stood, the Quakers and, and the Mennonites and others who have long stood that as a Christian you shouldn't go to war. And, and while I don't agree with that position either, uh, you can't make it from this commandment, Exodus 20, 13, you shall not commit murder. You may not believe in war. I say get married for a year and you may change your mind, right? <laughs> so what is this commandment, thou shalt not murder, talking about? What is it talking about? What does it mean in this day and age to be pro-life? Because I think that it's, that's been labeled as a political position, right? We're pro-lifers or we're pro-choicers or, or we're somewhere in between. And it's been labeled as a political position. I want to take it as a moral position of what it means to be pro-life. What does it mean to stand for life? Just the other day I was reading uh, an article that was talking about abortion and, and how they were uh, making it harder to get and this, that, and the other. And down in the comment line, someone had made the comment that we, are, we as Americans uh, overvalue life. Let me say that again. This person's opinion was is that we place too much value on human life. And their argument was, was that we have too many people on earth now. Why overpopulate the earth? Why not allow uh, more abortions rather than trying to limit abortions? And it just makes me sick to my stomach that people don't value this gift that God has given to be created in His own image. Wow. So what does it mean to be pro-life? Well, first of all, I believe that life has value because God created it. Amen? Life has value because God created it. What gives us value is God. What makes humans valuable is that God created us in His image. God scooped down and out of the dust of the earth He created Adam. Then He took a rib and He created Eve. And, 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 and He placed them in that garden together. And down through the ages He has created everyone who has ever lived on this earth. Right? What gives us value is God. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God has given us dominion. Now, I don't believe that that should give us license to just go and just just destroy the resources of this earth, okay? I don't believe that. I believe that we should be good stewards of the earth God has given us. But to place more value on some creeping animal in the middle of a swamp than on human beings is just dead wrong. It's dead wrong. God has given us dominion over this earth as human beings. He has placed us in the order, and we should be good stewards of it, but we should do what we need to do with it. And I know I'm sounding political, but I promise you I'm staying within the confines of God's Word today. The greatest cultural shift in our lifetimes, though, friends, has been the view of life and how important it is and its great value. Remember, even when I was a young, young adult, 20 something years old, there was the story of Dr. Kevorkian. Remember him? The suicide doctor who. Um, fought legal battle after legal battle, and I think he went to prison at one time for assisting people in suicides. You know, I'm a young man still. I, I consider myself a young man. I'm 42 years old. When I was born, abortion was illegal in the United States of America. In my short lifetime, we have gone from it being an Ill illegal to abort a human life to what we have today. 
for literally hundreds of thousands of babies, their lives are snuffed out every single year. It breaks my heart. And I weep for them. I weep for those little hands, those little feet, those little hearts that were beating. You, you've heard those monitors, haven't you? When the when it sounds like somebody's somebody's just just patting with a hammer on the wall as fast as they can, the little heart, and all of a sudden, poof, it is snuffed out at the hands of a so-called healer, a physician. Hmm. What happened? Why has there been such a shift in the last 40 years in our nation? I can think of one answer. In our school system, instead of it being a, a theory by some guy from the 1800s, the theory of evolution has turned into scientific fact. Y'all all right? Where they open up a textbook and, and, and say that it's an undisputed fact that we evolved from just creepy crawly creatures from amoeba all the way through apes, all the way to higher, higher, higher forms until you finally have a man. And, and then you have a, you, you, we finally get there. And what it's telling our children has been that for a generation and a half to two generations is we're nothing but animals. So what? What's the value of a life? That's at the heart of what we're, what we're dealing with here is that we just, we have taken away the very hand of God in life and we wonder why it's not valued anymore. You know, it was God who conceived, it is God who conceives life. We, we've got the wrong idea. We think sometimes that conception happens when, when the sexual act happens and the sperm unites with an egg. You know, when life happens, it happens when God creates life, right? Yes, there's a scientific explanation, but none of it could happen without the hand of God being involved in that. Do you believe that? Ruth chapter 4, verse 13 says, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he had went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Every life has value, whether it's born or whether it's unborn, because God created it. Yeah, y'all can say amen. God created it. Life has value because God created it. Secondly, why, what does it mean to be pro-life? Well, life has virtue because God controls it. Life has value because God created it. Life has virtue because God controls it. The same God that put me here ultimately controls my life. Now, some people want to discount that God's got any control over them, that they're masters of their own domain and captains of their own ship. But it just ain't so, friends. It's not. Murder is wrong because it usurps the sovereignty of God. It usurps God's plan. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 6 is not up on the screen because 1 Samuel decided not to live in media shout anymore. But 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 6 says these words. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. Friends, life has virtue because God controls it. This business of life and death is the sole responsibility of God. That includes homicide. It, inc it includes suicide. It includes pedicide, uh, either, either the um, abortion or killing of young, young children. That happens all over this world as well. Unwanted children. It is God's domain. So let's get real for a second, friends. Just for a second. Let's get real and really get to the heart of the abortion issue. Can we? From a moral perspective, I'm not talking about politics. I'm not talking about left, right, center, uh, libertarian, tea party. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about right and wrong. Let's get to the heart of it. There can only be one real reason to oppose abortion. You know what that real reason is? It is the taking of an innocent human life. That's the reason 
to, to oppose abortion. Uh, there may be some good pragmatic arguments for abortion, that, that the world is overpopulated and, and that if, if we hadn't have done that, then there would have been, there were, if, if all these babies hadn't have been aborted, there would have been just too many mouths to feed. There might be other pragmatic arguments that, you know, that mother's, that mother's life would have been ruined by the baby and that he just, he, it, it was the best thing. I'm gonna tell you, all that just melts away when you hold up the true fact that t the abortion is taken of a human life. I was in Little Rock, Arkansas in a pizza place at, one, at Gray's birthday, or birthday party that Gray, I took Gray to, one of his friends at Chuck E. Cheese or someplace like that. And I was sitting there and there was an old black pastor. And he was an old, old minister and he was, we, we got to talking as we can kind of spot each other. We got radar for, for other preachers, you know. And we got to talking and, 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 and he came up through the civil rights movement and he was decidedly a, a liberal liberal person as far as po politics go. And we got to talking about abortion, you know, and went there and he said, yeah, I just can't support uh, telling a woman what to do with her body, you know, and got on and on. I said, listen, sir, let's, let's just boil it down just for a minute, okay? Is, do you believe that that's a human life inside of a mother's womb from conception? He said, yeah, I do. I said, then, then there's no other position to take if you, don't, if you believe it, it is a life. Now, I got him to concede that it was a human life, but he still couldn't change. He still couldn't change that political belief that had been ground into him his entire life. That's terrible when politics take precedence over right and wrong. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you believe politically. It still should submit to the truth of what's right and wrong. Kids are God's idea. Amen? They are a blessing from the Lord. The Bible says children are a reward from God. Children don't come from parents. They come through parents, right? They come from God. Therefore, there's no such thing as an illegitimate child, friends. There's no such thing as an as, as a, as a illegitimate baby. You are God's idea. You are God's plan. So I'm going to change gears for a second. Murder is not just the physical act of taking someone's life. It can also be a condition of the heart. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22 says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of, of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. That was Jesus' words. And what he's saying is, is that murder is a matter of the heart, of not valuing someone's life as a creation of the Lord. Have you ever been mad enough that you could have murdered someone? I have. I'll be honest with you. They've been... And, and, and in God's eyes, in Christ's eyes, according to that, I was just as bad as Dr. Kevorkian or, or Jeffrey Dahmer or someone else that committed the act of murder. 1 John 3.15 says, Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We have to control our hearts. We have to control our minds and our attitudes toward other people. Clarence Barrow once said, I have never killed anyone, but I've led a, read a lot of obituaries with great joy. Same thing. Life has value because God created it. Life has virtue because God controls it. But finally, life can have victory because God can change it, right? I'm so glad that that was not the final word about uh, my heart as I've hated someone in my heart enough that I could have killed them and, and will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. I'm so thankful the Lord can come into my heart and change my heart. He can come into your life and change your life and give you life eternal. Life has victory because God can change it. You may not be guilty of homicide. You certainly aren't guilty of suicide or pedicide. You may have never had an abortion. You may never even had that in your heart to kill someone. But do you know that the ultimate act of murder 
is what I'm going to coin the term today is deicide, the killing of God. Now, if you went around your neighborhood and conducted a survey and asked which commandment people were sure they hadn't broken, you'd probably get uh, the overwhelming response that I've never killed anybody. I've never committed murder in my life. However, this is the one commandment that each and every one of us have broken. Jesus Christ died because we are sinners. Translation, my sin and your sin killed Jesus Christ. Amen? You believe that? The good news, the good news is because of that murder, because he was killed, God will forgive my sins if I call upon his name. Amen. That's good news today. That's what being pro-life is really all about. It's being pro-life eternal. That people can change. That lives can change. That the Lord can come and make life new. And turn you into a new creation. Maybe you've been out there and you've had an abortion. Maybe you've attempted suicide. Maybe you've wished somebody dead so much that the, your heart was just convicted by it. Maybe you've even done some things that that nobody wants to speak of. Let me tell you, God can forgive you today and He can give you a new life in Him. Choose life today in Jesus Christ. And that is my prayer and my plea to you today on this Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Yes, human life has great value, but eternal life has the ultimate value in Jesus Christ. Would you stand quietly as we pray?